Hello, everybody. It's, it's an honor to be here on this stage again after nine years. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do some explaining of six projects. Um, the first thing I was going to show um, was a project that, that was done that's, uh, a year and a half ago in London. And it, it, was, had, had to have, it had to be very top secret. And uh, so it had a code name, and the code name was Betty, because this dog was called Betty. And so we had to shred every drawing in the studio, hide every model in locked up containers. Um, and uh, the, the thing that we had been asked to do was to, do, um, to, to design the flame for the London Olympics. And we were, it, there's a kind of, uh, um, obvious flash factor to doing the, called the thing that a, a billion people are going to see, potentially. Um, and, but then, when we stopped and spent, there was a weekend spent with uh, DVDs of every Olympic opening ceremony that there had ever been. And so you're watching horsemen coming along with flames doing things, and you're watching um, people shooting arrows and all sorts of things. Um, what came through clearly was that, in general, and it's weird because we've just had one, um, the when we were speaking to people about it, that no one remembered the design of Olympic cauldrons. And so the, the kind of vanity of, oh, we're designing the Olympic cauldron, and then realizing, but no one ever remembers them. And then thinking, well, so what is it that they do remember? And the, it was so powerful realizing that what people remembered was people and moments, not objects. And so who cares if we were going to design a twisted bowl, flame bowl on a twisted stick or a squarer one on a, or a rounder one? The, w what really stuck in your mind was a shaking Muhammad Ali going in Atlanta to light the flame or the uh, Paralympic archer in Barcelona who, sh who shot the arrow. And the... And the reason that the arrow in Barcelona that was the one when we spoke to people that most people remembered uh, was because you didn't know whether they were going to, whether that arrow was going to actually get into the bowl, into the bowl that was on the top of the stadium. And, uh, but my th it, then my brain got stuck thinking that actually the reason you remembered it is because quietly you're thinking, well, they're never going to take a risk, are they? There's going to be a man standing there with a little flame ready to light it <laughs> if, there's, if they miss. Um, but the thing that then was sticking in your brain really was thinking, but what if they shoot that man? <laughs> and, and so we were, it became clear that there, was the, how, that there was this event, and maybe I'm a bit Olympic slushy, but the, I didn't mean that in a winter slushy way, but I mean in the, the notion of 204 countries coming together and not squabbling for just two weeks is, is powerful. And it seemed that there was an opportunity to see whether the way, as people only really remembered the way something was lit, was there a way to make the way something's lit be the it? And so we, we were there... And we'd been given this brief, which was to put the cauldron on the roof of the stadium, and there was a bit that had been strengthened to take 200 tons already, and to make sure that there were no moving parts as well. And so we were there, and going through uh, at the process within our, our studio, and, we, and then realized that we should try to celebrate the 204-ness of it, rather than who cares what we design as a singular bowl on a stick? And was there famously Olympic parks afterwards become quite derelict sites? And there tends to be a sad looking Olympic flame gathering pigeon poo sort of sitting in one bit that you're not allowed to light ever again. And so we just wondered if there was a way to make something that there was nothing left to, to gather. Um, uh, what I was just talking about. Um, and uh, so we, what we evolved was an idea for something where it was not one thing. It was pieces about the same size as Tom's laptop. Um, 
and we didn't know whether, whether it would work. Um, each country, uh, there was a child who carried in one of these copper pieces, and, and we chose copper because we were there, the, the obvious thing was to have gold, and, and it felt that gold, silver, and bronze were busy for those two weeks, and so it felt <laughs> there's this beautiful metal that, um, that normally is boiler tanks or something like that. And uh, so that, the, there was then, uh, we didn't know if anyone would notice those pieces, so that, but then they were placed in the center of the stadium, and then there was the lighting. The transfer of the privilege and the honour, lighting the cauldron. Can we have the volume? Seven great British Olympic heroes offering that honour to these young athletes. Literally passing the torch. Our first glimpse of the cauldron. Designed by Thomas Heatherwick. It really is a stunning work of art. One of the most closely guarded secrets of this whole ceremony. Young athletes, touch the cauldron with the torches. And the flames spread. Now we see what the copper petals were all about. More than 200 of them. Now burning brightly. The long, elegant stems gently rising, converging, to form one great flame of unity. Really is beautiful. A symbol of the peaceful coming together of nations at the Olympic Games. in its beauty and its ambition. So the Olympic flame entrusted to a new generation. So, thank you. So that was quite a scary moment for the student. It had never worked before that point. Um, and uh, and it, 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 so it was when we presented it to Danny Boyle, the creative director, and the people from the, uh, the technical team who had given us the brief to have no moving parts originally, because <laughs> it had the most moving parts in the history of Olympic cauldrons. It had a 1,000. Um, but afterwards, there were these pieces with the imprint of the heat of these two weeks uh, that, that copper does so well. And each one had the name of the country, the 30th, the 30th Olympiad, London 2012. But, um, and so they were then sent back to all the participating countries. The second project has, has some family relationship, but is completely different, it, which is we were commissioned to build a new university building in Singapore. Uh, in the centre of the Nanyang Technical University campus, where there are approximately 30,000, 40,000 students who are there. And the, the challenge was they, they were saying that you don't, 
In our, in our first discussions, that you, you don't really need to go to university anymore because university used to be where the books are, and now all the books are in the computers. And uh, in the past, you used to go to university because that's where all the computers were. And now we've all got them in our pockets, our gadgetry, and so you could stay in bed and do a PhD in your bed. So what's the point in going to university? And so the what what was exciting was they were saying the only purpose of university is to meet people. And so that, that then, when, you, when we were looking at the existing campus and looking at the kind of physical experience, and I think we've all been in places like this. And I mean, I remember when I was at university, it was only if there was a fire alarm that you got to meet everybody. It was great. I love fire alarms. And you're all standing out, freezing outside, but you find you're not alone in the building. And the brief... The brief for this building was for it to be a 24-hour uh, building. And if you're sending off your 17-year-old child, it's quite a bit sort of spooky in uh, places where cor this kind of corridorage. So we set ourselves the goal to try to make a corridorless university building. We were also asked, and this relates to one of the uh, slides that one of the previous speakers was, was showing, we were asked to not to have master and servant relationship between the wise guru professor and the slave students who are in front learning from their brilliance. And they, they said to us they wanted no corners in the tutorial rooms. And so we obliged. And so each of the, uh, each of the rooms has no corners. And we needed to have a building with 57 of them. And Singapore has this permanent summer condition as well. So we were just there trying to think of how, how how do we make a, a place with 57 um, more private spaces uh, without necessarily that familiar feel of campus buildings that just pop up by the same architects who've done all the campus buildings one by one with the kind of flavor cladding or louvers on the outside of whatever the architectural trend is. And so we were sort of there thinking about this device where normally to inspire people to learn Libraries tended to do that, to just walk into a space that has half a million books, hits you in your stomach. But with it, when those aren't there, what is it that you've got that's going to somehow drive, drive something forward? So uh, our building is made from 12 of these, uh, and they are uh, arranged when there's, with cores, the sort of orangier ones are the, the stair cores and elevator cores, and the bluey one is the the washrooms, and the thing that uh, is that they all face each other, and they're connected, and we tried to make the maximum nooks and crannies, so that the, your circulation has lots of spaces that aren't necessarily just driving you from uh, tutorial room to tutorial room. So uh, the building it, and is their balconies. So the building isn't one building, it's 12 buildings. Um, and they, they are coming together, and I've got a really a slightly duff animation, but it gives the idea, I hope. But the, the, the model of the past of university buildings seemed to be these monotonous long corridors, things that reminded a student that they were one forty thousandth of a university, and we were trying to create the human scale, and on a lot of our projects, we're trying to sort of re-find a human scale in environments. Um, so this building has now been in construction uh, for uh, a year and a quarter, and part of it is that we, our budget is just a little bit more than a, uh, a car park. And so to, to, to try to make, uh, to, but it, it, to, to achieve the particular Singapore construction codes and to meet the budget uh, and to meet all the different regulations. It meant uh, the columns are going to be concrete, the slabs are concrete, the cores are concrete, and finally the cladding is concrete. So when you say concrete to a British person, they kind of, there's not a feeling of, oh really, how interesting. There's a kind of, mm, as you feel the, the a particular, the South Bank, particularly in London, has this concrete is n not necessarily a, 
it feels a loveless material. And so it felt that our challenge, if we were going to embrace our concreteness, was that we needed to somehow find a way to give it love. And we realized, for example, columns. Property developers are, always have columns, that these circular columns. You see them in every office building, art gallery. They're all the same circular columns. And we needed to have these 57 uh, columns going through our building to hold it together, going through eight floors. So there's a lot of column you're going to see. And so we realized that we had one inch of love we could give that, con that concrete. And that as we were repeating them so many times, could we make these molds to make our columns from where the repetition would mean that they were cheap? So we developed um, these rubber form liners to cast these columns with, and those uh, had, we tried to maximize what, what that one inch could do for us. And so it has, the, the columns have these undulations that are the size of a human belly. So the slight inner pervert in us <laughs> can kind of strokes, goes to sort of gently touch, um, and which you don't normally do with columns. And um, so this was the very first kind of test one, and they've got smoother and more bellyish as we um, developed it. it was also, we worked with a brilliant illustrator because the concrete cores make the biggest surfaces of the building. And th we, so we were, we were determined to include warmth, to somehow bring warmth into the building. And also, these cores, we, she did 700 drawings, and we found a way to Im push and pull and embed those 700 sort of thought triggers into the uh, structural cores of the building. And so, these cores, uh, again, are using repeated form work, but we managed to find a pattern which means you won't see the same, you, you are unlikely to see the same bit repeat. Um, and so those just cut through. I mean, it's built really raw. It's, it's, uh, we, it's, it's a, a basic construction, but it brings some warmth. And then finally, the, the cladding that we've uh, been working on has just started to be uh, go onto the building, which is, uh, which is exciting and starting to add those together. But again, a lot of our work was trying to find warmth within the ingredients and materials that, uh, y that you pour together into the concrete. And we had a brilliant concrete contractor. Um, so that, that's uh, up to the fifth level now out of the eight. Um, and so a another project that is completed was where we were, because our passion in the studio is public. We're not interested in people's private homes or kind of luxury uh, resorts away from where we all are. And the, there's sort of almost nothing more public than infrastructure. And the, I remember someone saying that the, the sign of a, uh, of a successful city is that rich people take public transport, not that rich people drive. And, and um, London has, was famous for its double, red double-decker buses, but the route master that people are romantic about was phased out, except for a very few, tiny number, uh, uh, some years ago. And this hop-on, hop-off bit uh, was a bit where you, could, you had your life in your hands, but you were trusted with your own life. Um, and there was a desire from the new mayor and the head of transport for London to, to, re to create a new bus specific for London for this uh, new century. And the, the old bus had only one door, which meant that the time for loading and unloading was very varied, depending on if there's two people or 70 children. So they wanted to have a bus with three doors and two staircases, and they wanted a bus that would use 40% less energy than the existing diesel buses on the streets of London. And the, but one of the challenges was that the bus would need to, to have all the things we wanted. It needed to be almost three meters longer than the bus that people were romantic about. And so our brief was just a new bus for London. And what we found fascinating was that no design team had been given the task to design a, this piece of infrastructure 
London's famous for its red double-decker buses, but it's 50 years since the design team were allowed to think about a bus as one whole project. And in the intervening years, there's these collection of rules and regulations and um, codes and good practice that have all come in and been implemented incrementally. And so, the, if you go in most buses uh, that have been on the streets, the, the hand poles are nuclear warning yellow coloured, because you can tell someone said there needs to be contrast level between the hand poles and the background, and someone went, contrast? Did you say contrast? I'll give you contrast. And so, so they just max out on contrast when actually you can meet that code and a kind of human sense of calm without necessarily having to go to that extreme. And the same with lux levels, the level of light, that you can see there's been something about a level of light, which is understandable, but without a, a, a role that is to balance code and regulation with human experience, the, someone's gone, right, okay, you want light? I'll give you light. And so suddenly there's fluorescent tubes everywhere, just like in a battery chicken farm. And that makes your skin look bad, it makes your girlfriend's skin look bad, and you look bad to her, and everything's bad. And so it's, it seemed that there were a number of really basic things and for some, that we could, to some extent, unreinvent and, uh, and in, in moving forward. But one of the things was, if the new bus is actually the size of a, of a student coach uh, that brings uh, German school kids to London outside the hostels, how do you actually make that feel like a bus and not block up little London streets with these gigantic bricks? So one of the reasons that we rounded the bus was not out of uh, some romantic connection with a, a, a bus designed 50 years ago. It was literally to minimize the elevation because the, we were also struck that in, in London, if you were to build a new building, and most cities, if you were to build a new two-story building in the centre of the city, you would have the local authority and various different design advisory groups and quangos and the ability for uh, hundreds of thousands of people to all complain and comment and worry. And, uh, and, that, and there are 7,000 two-story buildings on wheels going around London, and uh, the only stipulation has been, is it red? <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> and, uh, and it seems astonishing from uh, it, it when the, that's where it, it feels that it, things do damage by the way that they're thought of uh, when, as, oh, well, that's, that's infrastructure, and that's product design, oh, that's architecture, oh, that's sculpture. Seems they're, they're things, and things have impact on all of us whatever a particular fashion in time decides to call those things. Um, so uh, another influence on this was trying to think about how we could counteract to achieve 40% uh, energy saving, the bus needed to be lightweight. To be lightweight, it meant that we needed to use composites. And composites is a sexy way to say fiberglass. And fiberglass is, I think, has generally reasonably bad associations, but it's a wonderful material because it can be the fire surface and it can be the structure of the bus and finish all in one go. So, but we felt you don't want fiberglass in your face. And often the staircases are your immersion into fiberglass tubes as you walk up and down bus staircases. So we decided to let the windows follow you so that, and equally that would mean that you are visible externally so the, the, the glass follows the movement of people, which is something that in the world of architecture is quite common that a building might express externally how it functions internally. But quite often infrastructure is sort of thought with a sort of different mindset. Um, so the, there are now 200 of these buses driving around central London. They're gradually being increased. Um, there's another 400 in production, and with, uh, with luck there'll be another uh, few thousand coming. Uh, and they're, uh, they're very much, a lot of the thinking was also how to calm the inside. I mentioned uh, nuclear warning lights and all of those things, um, but the things like when you've got two seats next to each other, for some reason the seats have kind of broken down to each being individual seats with a pl little plastic handle and a crevice that crisp packets can catch in. And those, they're never going to move apart from each other, 
And so our work inside was primarily just trying to calm the environment visually and to allow things to relate to each other so that the people are the color. And, uh, so, and to unreinvent these bench seats with just one seat that two people can sit on. And to try and give some love to things like staircases. Uh, and even though they are not the widest staircases, in fact, they're sort of the narrowest, to try to make something feel there's the theater and splendor and pride of being in the heart, moving around the center of one of the incredible cities of the world. And the, um, just the, however rich somebody is, if, and if they've got their Ferrari or whatever, you can't get a better view of London than being at the front of a double-decker bus. And that's felt, the, the, our focus must be on the dignity of the passenger. And that sounds a pompous sounding word, but it was, it's what excited us uh, with this. Um, and so gradually, yes, they're, they're, they're coming across London. Uh, before showing the, the last two projects, I was, I was just going to show the other project that we've done from the past, which was uh, in Shanghai at the World Expo that happened in 2010. And as, as, as a thought process, the, the, the World Expo that happened in Shanghai had 100 million people go to it. It was the biggest ever World Expo. There were a million people on average every day that it was open. And when you imagine being at a World Expo, you start getting, and in that, you start getting a headache. And so there were going to be 250 pavilions, and we were chosen to build the British pavilion. And if there are 250 pavilions, and on average there's a three-hour wait for each one of those pavilions, it was a kind of mind-numbing misery. And when you imagine that we, our job in the brief from the British government, it said, show that Britain has good food, show that Britain <laughs> has a good economy, show that Britain's a good place to go on holiday, you know that every country is doing the same list. And, but at the end of the, and show that you're a sustainable country, you know, and then at the very end, the very last statement was, there's going to be voting, make sure you're in the top five. <laughs> and it was, that was the most useful thing. It's, it's sort of the English gentleman thing is a bit busted by that, but it was, it was the bit of the brief that we paid attention to, because it was clear that if there were, if there were 250 pavilions, and it's, there's a three hour queue, uh, most people are, are only going to manage to see five or six of them or something like that if they're lucky. And unless you go for six months to the expo. And the expo is like each one of... So, so to achieve that objective, we as a design team had to imagine what everyone else might do because there were, no other pavilion existed. So we all had two years till the expo. To, so to be in the top five, you had to second guess what everyone else would do and then not do it. And so we sort of analyzed and we looked and there seemed to be a main pattern, which was the architect won the competition, spent the money on the building, built a building as big as their site, run out of money, then the interior team were pissed off, and then there ends up with a film inside. And that seemed to be the thing, and that always tended to happen. Um, and I forgot to say one other bit of the brief was that we were given half the budget of the other Western nations. And so that focused things completely and was, again, useful somehow. Um, and so w it seemed in this context, which is like uh, if you haven't done your Christmas shopping and you were to go to New York or London, or in fact, New York and London, and go to every shop in New York and every shop in London and think I'll go to every museum, you know, visually you're bombarded with everything. So your retinas become fried and you, you're sensitivity is evaporating. And I, I know that feeling where you end up and you're just looking with tunnel vision around if something, and you're spoilt. And so thinking, how can something uh, mean something? And it felt to us to do that. We, it was about what we wouldn't do rather than so much what we would do. And it seemed that if we do the same kind of thing that you would expect and go on and on and on about tea and go on and on and on about Manchester United and uh, those, this, the whole and the things, Sherlock Holmes and 
it, it felt that we conform to what people expect. And when something's what people expect, their perception cone dr dr closes right in. And so it felt, but when you see something that you can't quite get, your perception cone, I've just made that up, expands, <laughs> and you're, you, you really go towards something. Um, so we were trying to think, what is true? The expo is about the future of cities. What could we say that actually did mean something and was true that related to Britain? And one thing was that some of the British cities are the greenest of their size in the world for the sheer quantity of parks, heathlands, private square, public squares uh, that the Victorians put in place. And the world's first major botanical institution, the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, was also um, the, set up in, in London. And so we worked with them, and they agreed to give us a quarter of a million seeds. And uh, so we, the project that we built was... Uh, we, we realized that we needed to, to make it work with the budget. We needed to not try to fill our site. Everyone, all of us had a football pitch, and it seemed... But there was this regulation that you couldn't build higher than 20 meters on the site. And if you built a building 100 meters by 60 meters by 20 meters, which is all you're allowed to do, all the buildings would be these kind of squat, low, stumpy things, and they wouldn't... And you actually couldn't fit them in a photograph neatly, even then. Um, that's how hard-nosed we are. Um, and then, so we realized, why, if we do something that is a sixth of the site, we could use a tiny bit of the site to be a thing you'd remember, and design five-sixths of the site to be forgettable. And in the forgettable bit, we could put the broom cupboards, staff training rooms, the prime minister's entertaining space and conference facility, because all you need to do is do one thing. And so we managed to convince the British government to just do one thing and uh, to, to, to do a, a project. So that this is a plan of the site with all the other uh, spaces there. Um, and it, that, so that object, we also realized that if there was a million people every day, I, mean the, I think the Tate in London gets about... Uh, three, three million people a year, three, or something, three and a half million, something like that. Uh, th there was no way that we could get a million people a day going into our pavilion. So we needed to make people feel that they had been and seen it, and without feeling they were on the outside. So how could the outside be the inside? And so this idea evolved for an extreme texture, and that uh, the texture kind of came out of something some thoughts we'd had that related to a particular... Introducing the new Play-Doh Mop Top Hair Shop. We'll get the Mop Tops. The Play-Doh Mop Tops. Just turn the chair. It will shake your hair. Get the Mop Tops. You can comb it, wave it, style it or shave it. The Play-Doh Mop Tops. You can let it grow down to his toes. Get the Mop Tops. From the Play-Doh Mop Tops Hair Shop. The what? I met the man who designed it. This is him. Um, but the thing was that that allowed us to make a very simple bot. What we were interested in was projecting when you got a hard... Most buildings, you're very aware of the box and the skin. And we wondered how much could we project a texture till you lost the volume and you just experienced a texture. And could we make a building that was soft? And uh, so from that uh, evolved this project called the Seed Cathedral and it tingled in the wind, and it sat, as you can see, uh, it was one of the smallest pavilions at the whole expo, and it, uh, it, it, we set it in a context of a landscape that was soft, so that even if you were partially sighted, your feet would crunch across a, a, a different texture, which had a strong acoustic effect, and then you walked up the landscape and across a, uh, a bridge link, and the you went into an environment where there was no famous actors' voices, no colour-changing LEDs, nothing asking you your opinion, and there was just a quarter of a million seeds. Deal with it. And uh, <laughs> one of those seeds might be the, the, the reason that a medicine was developed, that your grandmother lived for another 15 years because of that, or the whole econ economy of one particular country could depend on one of those species 
Um, and so we, we uh, let that uh, speak for itself as much as we possibly could. But I think you can maybe imagine what it was like presenting that to the British government, to presenting, because they were, oh, so it's like a nut shop. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, but uh, so, so this is just daylight coming through these 66,000 seven and a half meter optics and trapped at the end, like in Jurassic Park, the uh, insect in the amber uh, was just a different seed species. Uh, and the part of this was also that uh, we, this was it, at, in the helicopter before it opened, and we, we also didn't tell the British government that there was actually a, a Union Jack flag within the pattern of the optics. Um, so this is real, this isn't a, uh, a, a, an animation, it's the only project we've done where the real thing looked more like a computer animation than the computer animation. Um, uh, so the, there's two more things to show. There's, um, there's two more things to show, and these are about uh, futures and trying to make projects happen that you haven't necessarily been asked to do, but they, you're trying to generate and make, make something happen. And this project is for the centre of London, and it's an idea that an actress who was a Bond girl in uh, the 60s had, and not in, back in the 60s when she was a Bond girl, she had this idea 15 years ago, and uh, I met her 13 years ago, and she, uh, I thought this was a fantastic idea, and when we had done these two, three national, national-ish projects, it gave the studio a platform, and after the Olympics, there was a bit of a kind of didn't go wrong. The Olympics didn't go wrong. British people couldn't believe. They, everyone was expecting the Olympics to all fail. And so there was a sort of optimism, a quiet, cynical optimism of kind of, well, <laughs> so what next? And so we've, we've been w working to push this project um, and it, it relates to the river and you can see that there's this pattern of crossings uh, in central London and the bend in the river in a way is the epicentre of London. And uh, we've got our cultural heart of London split. There's our West End culture on the north there and our more arts culture on this South Bank here. And everyone used to worry about the South Bank back 20 years ago. And now the South Bank is, is, is so successful and has its own momentum. And actually, sorry, I haven't got laser pointers and I can't jump high enough, but the, uh, the, uh, there's Waterloo Bridge is that, is this, th that bridge there. And... Uh, just uh, above it is Somerset House, which is a sort of arts uh, building. And, but on the north bank is where there's a dual carriageway separating the city from the river. And it is a, it's a bit like the lights go off in London when you go east. Everyone was worrying about the south, but actually just the north going east there, there's St. Paul's Cathedral over there, and there's this sort of mishmash bit of road and a place called Aldwych that by itself... If you see it spelt, sounds like someone's got random letters of the alphabet and liquidized them together. And that's how it feels when you go there. But if you look at the quality of river crossings in arguably one of the two, three thought leading capitals of the world in terms of people who come to base themselves in London and the historic institutions and momentum that's built up. When you look at uh, Waterloo Bridge, so famous bridge got a uh, song by the Kinks, um, uh, designed very much for cars, buses, taxis, motorbikes, lorries. The, the human experience of the, that bridge in the centre, absolute centre of London, is of being on the side of a dual carriageway. I mean, the view is stunning, but I've never, uh, no one has ever said, oh, why don't we meet in the middle of Waterloo Bridge? It's not a, it's not a place. And so when you look at Paris and look at the Seine, which is 80, 90, 100 metres wide, the, our city is ripped apart in London with a quarter of a kilometre. And most people in this room seem pretty able-bodied, but if you're not so able-bodied, you think twice before you walk a quarter of a kilometre. And so uh, Joanna Lumley, whose um, who, uh, idea this was, sort of said, well, could, is there a way to make 
this, not just see the river as an obstacle that you must always just try to breach that obstacle, but is there a way that inland sea, this phenomenal piece of nature, could be, uh, there could be a place to be more in the, in, in the heart of that. And so when we were looking for where that could fit, we, we found that this place, this funny place called Aldwych, with its weird one-way system I won't bore you with any more about, um, uh, there was the Waterloo Bridge and this Grand Crescent. And down the other side was a possibility to create something that didn't, that really could feel it, fitted into the grain of the city uh, and open up uh, the historic temple area on the north. Um, but, and there's a tube station right in the heart. And if we look there, there's this little sleepy tube station and there's a little sleepy park with quite a lot of street drinkers uh, in the sort of epicenter of London. And this little uh, tube station, with, which is the most central tube station, arguably, in London. And most people have never been there from London, uh, unless you're being sued by, and you go to the barristers who are nearby. And, but it was perfect to land a connection on. Uh, and then on the south, there's this piece of grass, um, which is 80 meters long, 14 meters wide. So the idea that uh, Joanna had was to give London a new garden that would connect the city together. And so she had that idea back 15 years ago. And in the intervening time, this amazing project in New York happened, which is phenomenal. And it, that, combined with the Olympics, give this project the, have given this project a kind of drive and momentum to happen. Because um, so, there was this disused elevated railway line, and a, a number of residents and two very inspiring people drove this forward, and they're in rough, tough New York that seemed like it was never going to change in, in my youth when I was going there, um, has got this vulnerable garden which is like something you'd have in, in your own garden, and yet they've, they've, gotten, they've had, I heard, no single reported um, crime has happened there in the last three, four years since it's been open, uh, and it's just there floats like a dream through, through the city. So her idea was to give London a garden. Now, that was using an existing historic steel structure. A garden, the garden we were thinking about, means that we've got to hold up 1,200 cubic meters of soil, and that's heavy. And the, the last new pedestrian bridge in London, is its brilliance is its minimalism, and it's incredibly lightweight. But we, we knew that we have uh, a... A river, we've got the possibility to have two uh, river piers coming from the clay at the base of the river. And somehow we've got to get 1,200 cubic meters of soil's weight to come onto those two columns. But it also was clear that modern bridges often, the, there's two, there are columns and cables. And you're, you're used to that look, and they tend to be painted white, and the cables are stainless steel. And it felt that we, it, this mustn't feel like we went to the bridge shop and got that stuff. And it mustn't feel that, because they're also, the columns are a bit like pseudo trees lurking, and the cables are a bit like pseudo branches, and it felt our job, the hero of a garden bridge, must be the garden, not the bridge. And so our job as designers of it is to somehow hold up a garden and get out of the way, so the tallest thing is the blade of grass, or the bush, or the... Um, the tree trunk. So it, it, it kind of drove the project uh, that once you define that you can't have competing structure with the nature. So the, the, a bit like when they have guerrilla garden, gardening, throwing seeds in places they shouldn't, we just, the project is just growing these two river piers to, to, make, uh, to make two planters. So there's just two planters made from a, a, a special bronze called copper nickel that uh, doesn't go very dark brown, but has a warmth, and is neither concrete of the south bank or stone and brick of the north bank. And as you can see, we can get two meters of soil depth close to the columns, and that means we'll get naturally get taller tree species near the columns, and it, so the engineering will be echoed naturally by time and the growth of the plants. And it, uh, because the human beings don't have a highway code for how we move, it means it doesn't, we can follow the engineering and the, the columns are where we can carry load. And so the, it, it allows us to make a bridge that has four different routes to cross it. 
So it's 27 meters wide at its widest, which is the same as Waterloo Bridge. And it, um, the other thing that was important to us was how could we create a human scale on a piece of infrastructure? Because it's, people like doing big swoopy curves. And it's felt, mm, how do we make somewhere that is the slowest way to cross the Thames, if you choose it to be? And that's where, and this is completely inappropriate um, parallel, but you know there was the world's biggest ship. <laughs> um, the, there was the world's biggest ship at the time, but it had an intimate place at the front where, where people could be together. Now, if, if any of you know Joanna Lumley, she's, she talks about how you could have a triste on the bridge. or this. It's about the, the, the connection of people and bringing people together, or where someone would propose to someone or something like that. And so that's why those little, you see all the little, uh, the structure, we needed to have these fins radiating that will be the structural um, lines that hold the garden. And so just by trimming those uh, like slices of cake, it gives us these edges and places. So the project is just these two planters, and they, they make uh, a very, very sort of, uh, in some senses, simple uh, garden structure, which is these two planters, which as you walk onto, onto them, it grows in width. And we deliberately, the reason to not make a straight path is we didn't want you to just see the building on the other side, but instead to, to feel that there's garden. It, there is actually a very quick route across, but you can also be slow. But also to make these places that give that human scale back. And uh, it, it felt that in a, in a place where the, it costs £24.50 to go to the top of the Shard. You know, it's an amazing, wonderful new tower that's been built in London. And the London Eye that costs £14.50. If there was a way we could make somewhere that was free. And uh, so uh, there's a charitable trust that has been set up. And they are, uh, at the moment, in the process of raising £150 million. Pounds, and we've, the trust was incorporated six weeks ago, fully by the Charities Commission. And so far, they've raised uh, almost 100 million pounds. And so we, we are, uh, so, and we're working with um, uh, Richard Curtis, who set up Comic Relief, which is a, a charity that was the, the writer of Black Adder and think, uh, set up. And he's helping us. And in the summer, hopefully, there'll be a public campaign. We want there to be half a million people who help this project to happen, whether that's bequeathing a blade of grass or a shovel of gravel or a, or a, brand, a, a tree, a whole tree itself. But that was all preamble. Okay. This is, in some sense, this is the most exciting presentation I've ever had the chance to give because there's a, when, when I came to the design in Darba nine years ago, there was this just uh, incredible character called Ravi Naidu who managed to just pull together the world into this event here. And it, it was, it, it, we were treated like kings, and we, we, it, was a, a treat, it was an amazing thing. And, but we found ourselves talking about, well, what, because everyone has a lovely time, and then it all goes off, all let's go everywhere else again. And it's like, what, well, what, how does the Indaba manifest as, as things that are real, that stay? In, in South Africa. And uh, from that, has there, it was nine years ago, and there's been various discussions and things, but t t today uh, is a chance to, to now show a project that is a, a future here in, in Cape Town, and that, that wouldn't have happened with our involvement without, uh, without Ravi and the Indaba making that happen. Um, and the project is, uh, at the Victoria and Alfred waterfront. And there, there in, the, in the heart of the waterfront, I, I think the waterfront is the most visited site in Africa, is, has been this, this building that has existed for 90 years or so. And it's been a bit like, uh, is it like the elephant in the room? There's been this, this building that was the grain silo that some people didn't even notice, even though for many decades it was the tallest building in Cape Town. And when you speak to them, you go, oh, no, I don't know that. And you think, you've lived here for 40 years. And uh, so I'll just take you there very quickly. I don't know if this will work. Um, 
So this is where we are now. So it's very close. Just, just over there is this building, this giant building made from tubes. And uh, it, it was here in, as part of this a system that was unique in South Africa, which was a way there was this sort of collective grain uh, project where South Africa built grain silos across the whole of the country and the farmers would put their grain in and instead of, instead of selling their grain, they were putting their grain into one big collective system and, re and in return getting a kind of certificate, a share of that, which depending on when the, the value of South African grain was at any one moment, you could cash that in and uh, that would and then be paid. So it was this sort of coming together and this, this was Cape Town's main grain silo and it now sits, so for many decades it was the tallest building in Cape Town and it's, it sat there and it, but it only stopped being used, used in the 90s and it, it, um, it's Defining characters, it's unlike some big buildings, historic buildings that are infrastructure buildings that have been used for new purpose, purposes, it has no big space because it's full of tubes. In the one part of it, there's circular tubes and really interesting shapes between the circular tubes, these sort of um, cruciform, curved cruciform spaces. And then the other part is rectangular. Uh, thing. But So it's a big building with no no actual space to use. And unless you crane your neck down the tube or up a tube, uh, there's, there's, there's no singular space. Um, and so this is a slice through to show this unusual cellular building, made in effect these hollow fibers. And, but it's not really one building, it's two buildings. So there's the grain elevator to the right uh, and where the, the grain was processed in the top parts of this and, but there was the lower parts of the grain elevator, which is the taller part, and the other part are all tubes. So it seemed that uh, the question was, what's, what was this building for and in going forward? And the, the V&A waterfront um, changed hands, and the, the uh, property managers, developers, have been busy developing the whole of the waterfront. And they they got really ambitious and it was very exciting. We've, we've worked with different property developers at different times on, on our projects. And they, they, they got really ambitious with Ravi's help to sort of think about what this, this could do. And then came into the picture a man called Jochen Zeitz who, uh, who ran Puma, the uh, amazing sports company for many years. But more amazingly, has one of the two uh, most amazing uh, contemporary uh, African arts collections in the world. I mean, with a, cura a curator called Mark Cotier, who who's been systematically, analytically collecting the most... Uh, we, we were uh, blown away when we saw the, the pieces. So the project became a project to give... Sorry, I've slightly got a little goosebumpy thing myself to give Africa, uh, Africa's first major institution for contemporary African art. And when you go to Asia and you see the quantity, it's amazing. Um, spending time in China, Taiwan, and other, people are banging out museums like that. You know, everywhere, everyone's been to Barcelona and thought, oh, let's have a museum like that, or let's go to Bilbao and we'll have a bit something like that. And he's mimicking what other cities are doing as a sort of sign of puffing the chest and whereas this and then thinking well, what do we put inside it or oh, doesn't matter we've had someone famous design it and whereas here did start with this collection and this which would be the first time a collection of this magnitude because there are only two in the world I understand um, would be made public uh, and where better than in South Africa and in Cape Town and here right in, on the waterfront in such an incredible location. So it felt inappropriate to us to knock it down and build a sort of Fandango uh, new shape. When the, you've got a building that's tubiness is spectacular. And so the project, we, it, it's, 
It's got a really modest budget. It's it's because it's not a city, it's not a country, it's not a nation building it. It's it's property developers and and an incredibly passionate collector team trying to make a public philanthropic project happen. And uh, so we've been honoured to have the chance to go on that voyage and try to find the way to manifest that. And we all felt, how can we work with this, this building? So one thing seemed to be that building that has no space in it. And it's so we were there with these two, two buildings, in fact, and thinking about how the, the are we going to suddenly put windows or, through all these tubes or something? And it's, but m many, many of the pieces are incredibly light sensitive. So actually not having windows into major uh, swathes of the building is, is actually suitable. And uh, so we were just thinking, how can we bring these two buildings together? And uh, something we had to have was some form of circulation and a moment that clarified and brought everything together. So the focus of this project became, and we went through all these studies, became not its outside, but its inside. So if this was a, um, a belly button, it's an inny one, not an outy one. Um, and uh, that's gross, isn't it? Sorry. Um, but they become, so the, the, we needed to make a space at the heart of this. And so it felt that maybe the way to unify these two, two buildings was to create a main public space so you could understand how to move through and where all the different levels were in, in one go and not get confused in what could otherwise be a, a maze of uh, capsulation or segmentation. So, um, so the, that, and that space could then allow you to access the galleries and uh, other main public spaces of the building. The concrete of the building, you saw it's kind of painted magnolia, bedroom magnolia at the moment. And we realized that underneath that is this, and this slide doesn't even show it properly, the concrete underneath is, is quite beautiful. It's made from this quite bluey stone. And uh, a piece had dropped off of this sort of gunge that had been sprayed all over it. And so the plan is to just strip back to the raw, strip back and seal the, the raw uh, original concrete that this was built at the beginning of last century. And um, then, then it was trying to think about how would we handle the parts which were um, the, the, where we did want to bring daylight in, where there was an existing concrete and steel frame. And so we thought, well, okay, if we could take out, if we could cut out all the flat panels between the concrete frame, um, we we get rid of those, uh, and then um, we, it was. Then what do we have? We've glazed another building with frames. And it felt that the glazing must somehow mean something more. And because we're so used to the flatness of glass, the world of flat buildings and glass that, glass is amazing, but its sterility and the perfection of its manufacture have kind of killed it from the days when it had wobbles and you could see, uh, you could look at trees and move around and suddenly they were warped around because of the imperfection. Um, so we wondered whether a bit more like the, in, in Venice, they take these uh, wire, chicken wire structures and blow glass into them, and the glass then has a three-dimensionality, and wondered whether we could introduce into this build, in, building, take its concrete and steel structure and put glazing, but allow that to just respond and have a softer relationship to the structure. So um, the building has these pillowed windows that's just the, I suppose, the, the only signal of, of uh, a, a new incarnation uh, uh, other than the concrete and outside, but it allows them to have these very gentle uh, undulations in the surface. Um, so this is a simple uh, exposure. So this is uh, a building called um, Zeitzmocker. Uh, so the, in terms of the inside, the, we had fallen in love with the concrete. And we were just there thinking, we, do we just throw away this phenomenal idiosyncrasy that the building has? And so we were there with a unique thing. I mean, the turbine hall in London that was turned into, that was part of Bankside Power Station that became Tate Modern, it already had spectacular spaces. We had no space to work with. So we looked at how could we take those tubes, and if we cut them, 
If we just cut them vertically, they are relatively sterile. But if you cut through in a curve or at an angle, that seemed to be where it drew out things that were true to the structure but felt fresh somehow to the eye. So we found that we could, if we cut through at an angle, we would uh, create these unusual shapes. So the project has one simple move to create the main circulation of the building, and that's to just cut a single grain. For, so a single grain through in the heart of the building it isn't on the outside, it's in the inside, so that when you go inside, the carved through the tubes of the building is this single central space, um, which you'll be able to go into, uh, and the, it will, um, as, you're, as you're in that space, We've put, we put glass and let light through from above. And, the, uh, and then things like the staircase, uh, this, the staircases over there can look like the, will be just be spiral stairs that are, look just like piling rig, gigantic drill bits that go through. And the elevators uh, can just move vertically up and down within the vertical shafts of, of the structure. Um, and so the concrete will be uh, strength will give, be given a reinforcing kind of girdle on the inside and cutting through. And this morning there were cutting tests taking place. Um, and it's uh, technically going to be a huge challenge cutting through a, a building that's kind of a century old. Um, and uh, I'll just show you the, the, I've got a very rough as a dog just uh, animation to just uh, explain this. So these are the track sheds at the front, which is where the trains used to come in uh, at, the, at the very front. And we're keeping those track sheds because they're, they're uh, or reinstating them properly because they, they make a perfect arrival place. So you'll be able to go up onto the top of that main, the main top level uh, where there are of all the circular tubes and be able to, I hope, the best African coffee mix possible with the killeriest view of the tablecloth and all the amazing things of Cape Town. Just as this animation is a bit low resolution, the real project will be a bit low resolution, <laughs> but we're just so excited that, uh, uh, I mean, whether we were doing it or not, we're excited that a project, this project is happening, and we're just honored to have the chance to work, work with everybody with the energy that's there. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>